Hi, I'm Dave Litton and welcome to my Learn Prince 2 Risk Management in 22 minutes flat. So let's start off by talking about the Prince 2 Risk theme, Objectives, the purpose of which is to identify risks, to assess them and control their uncertainty, and as a result, improve the ability of your project to succeed. Now there's seven Prince 2 principles, and the one which aligns itself with risk is the continued business justification, since a risk to any of the project objectives may cause the business case, and hence the project, to no longer be viable. When we talk about the impact of risks, we're talking about the impact to one or more of these particular objectives. Prince 2 has a definition saying a risk is an uncertain event or set of events that if they occur will have an effect on the project's objectives. Well, a perhaps a more simpler way of describing risk is something which has yet to happen and it may or may not happen at some point in the future. However, if it does happen, it will have an impact on one or more of the project objectives. And here we can see the six objectives to which I'm talking about. One, of course, is risk itself, because, of course, a project may be too risky. Risk may affect the benefits. It may have an impact on the scope of the project, what you're including and what you're not. It may cause the costs to increase or decrease. It may impact the quality in some way or the time. In other words, the schedule and time frame of the entire project. So what is it we need to do to risk? Well, effective risk management means identifying all known risks at any given point in time, then going on to assess the risk and then to take some form of actions, in other words, to control the risk and to make sure those actions are having the desired effect. We also need to generate a risk management strategy which describes our risk approach and then to implement responses to manage project risks. So the risk management strategy is a how-to. Every project is different and we need to set out a clear approach to manage the risks within a given project. Now risks can come in two flavours. The first which most people relate to a risk is called a threat and this is where the uncertain event will have a negative impact in this case on any of these here. But there's another type which is called an opportunity. This of course is an uncertain event still but this time having a positive impact so, so it might allow you to decrease the cost of a project as a result of an opportunity arising. They're both tied together and called a risk because they both have uncertainty. Let's have a quick look at the main points within a typical project using the PRINCE2 processes of where risks will need to be managed in some way. Pre-project, when we're using the starting up a project process, we have the daily log. And it's in the daily log that we would capture any risks and record appropriate actions to be taken at that or some future point. The project brief is the main document and this along with the initiation stage plan including the risks in carrying out the initiation stage will form the basis for the project board to make a decision whether to proceed to initiating a project or not. In the initiating a project process the risk register is set up and any risks that need formal management that already sit in the daily log will be transferred to it and the risk register will now be used throughout the remainder of the project. The project initiation documentation is created and in particular the risk management strategy document which as I said earlier is the approach you take to managing risks. During a typical delivery stage we have the controlling a stage process and the managing product delivery processes working together. The project manager in controlling a stage and the team manager and the specialist team members within managing product delivery. Risk can arise at any point and can change, of course, during the life of a project. So the risk register would need to be updated if either of those two situations arise. Don't forget that issues can be raised and these may cause some impact to the risks themselves. So there can be a relationship between these two separate registers. In the same way, any particular risk may cause a new issue to be raised. The main products during a stage are the highlight and checkpoint reports that are raised and these would contain the status of any particular risks in the case of the highlight report for the project board and checkpoint reports for the project manager. At the end of every stage we use the managing a stage boundary process and the end stage report 
will contain, amongst other things, the status of any risks. When it comes to closing a project, any risks which could affect the operational life of the end product will be captured in the follow-on actions so that appropriate operational or business-as-usual staff can carry on managing such risks. Let's look at the risk management procedure next. Now, the management of risk, as I've said, is a continual activity performed throughout the life of the project. All of these steps are iterative. So I've redrawn the diagram as a linear flow. You'll see here I've split it into risk analysis and risk management. There are actually five steps here, the communicate step being in parallel. Because, of course, the communication of risk needs to occur throughout the project. You have the identify step, which would be step one, and in this case we identify the context of each risk and identify the risk itself. In the assess step, we estimate the risk and we evaluate it. Don't worry, I'll describe these in a moment. In the planning step, we determine what responses are appropriate, and in the implement step, we manage such responses, control and report against them. And as I said, communicate will be a continuous activity through steps one through to four here. One of the main problems with risk management is actually identifying risk correctly. The way to get this right first time is to remember that there are three steps. First of all, you have the risk cause or the source of the risk. Let's invent you have heavy traffic outside your home. Imagine you're about to go to work, if you will. Then the risk event itself, the uncertainty, due to heavy traffic, you may be late for work. And then finally, the risk effect or impact. <laughs> the boss will get mad. So if you think about risks in this way, you'll be a much more effective manager of risks. So let's go through these now in detail, starting with the identify step, identify context. What we're doing here is identifying the specific objectives that are at risk and to formulate the risk management strategy. Now, this particular document describes how, that's the key word, risk management will be embedded in the project management activities. So quickly looking at the risk management strategy, it starts off with the introduction, the purpose, objectives and scope, the, and the PRINCE2 procedure being used and tailored for this particular project, any particular tools and techniques to be used, and the records, of course, will be the risk register and the daily log is used throughout the project if any risks need to be managed informally rather than transferring them to the risk register. Reporting, you have the communications management strategy in the bid and the highlight and checkpoint reports. Talk about the PI grid shortly. The roles and responsibilities for risk management, project teams, stakeholders and risk owners. The timing, end stage assessments, particular audits during a stage or at the end of every stage, reviews and so on and so forth. And scales, which you choose to use for probability and impact. Again, I'll explain that later. And proximity, which is another element of risks, and that is when a risk will happen, the time frame within which it is likely to happen. This will help you manage it, of course. Risk categories, example, PESEL, which you've probably heard about. It stands for political, economic, sociological, technological, legal, and environmental. Risk response categories, those for both threats and opportunities, more of that in a minute. And any early warning indicators, such as triggers or limits that are about to be exceeded, that would give you a clue that a risk is about to happen, not happen, or happen in a different manner, as an example. Risk tolerance, limits for risks in general, and the escalation process, which of course will use the PRINCE2 management by exception approach. And a risk budget, it's an optional separate budget, and technique called expected monetary value can be used to determine this. Again, I'll touch on that later. But for now, the idea is to have a budget to pay for the management and implementation of any risk actions. Still in identify, this time it's identifying risks, recognizing the threats and opportunities that may affect the project. Here the risk register is set up and any risks existing in the daily log that need to be managed formally will be transferred here. And its purpose is to capture and maintain information on the project's identified threats and opportunities. By the way, typically maintained by project support, although the main user of this will be the project manager. What will this contain? A unique risk identification for each risk, the risk author, the person who identified it, 
the date it was first entered in the register, the category as per the risk management strategy, the risk description in plain language mentioning the cause, event and effect as I described in the previous slide, and the probability, impact and expected value as per the scales which I'll describe later. Proximity using agreed time frames, for example, within the stage, within the next stage, within the project or similar. Risk response categories as recommended in PRINCE 2 and the risk response out of these which one you're going to choose for this particular risk and the status as you're managing this particular risk throughout the project. Risk owner, this is the person who's responsible for managing it and the risk actionee, this may be the same person. For example, this might be the project manager and getting someone else to carry out the actions. For example, a specialist because they are best placed to manage the risk and to execute the chosen response. Risk identification methods. There are many. We have lessons learned, taking risks from similar projects, risk prompt lists, which may be in-house. Any assumption is potentially a risk. Interviewing key staff that may have experience of this. And of course, getting into a room and just generally brainstorming. A very good technique is to consider using a risk breakdown structure. Here I've just used technical risks as one of the many categories and you could for a particular project develop a breakdown structure which would come up with areas in, in which risks may occur and hence enter them into the risk log and determine what responses. I've mentioned PESEL already. These categories as well would help diagnose risks and determine their owners. Let's have a look at this. Suppose your particular project had to buy in a particular application from a third party. You simply create a diagram like this. Imagine if the third party was in a different country, the exchange rate may escalate costs. Product shipment in terms of time might cause delays to the schedule. The availability, is it off the shelf or will it have to be made in some way, could cause extra delays. Delays to the schedule could delay the product launch and in itself could affect revenue and hence the realisation of benefits within given time frames. And that, of course, would have a direct impact on the business case. So these show the casual influences among project variables, the timing or time ordering of events, their relationships and outcomes. Another technique is the cause and effect diagram, also known as Ishikawa or fishbone diagrams. Here the idea is that you take the area of uncertainty, in this case inconsistent test results, although it could use any other impacts, such as I've stated down here, and you would come up with key areas where you may wish to consider material, processes, project staff and hardware, just as an example here. And then you brainstorm the areas which could result in you uncovering risks that could lead to inconsistent test results. The reason why this is helpful is because you could deal with each of these in turn and then decide how you might mitigate such problems. Don't forget the project breakdown structure and product flow diagrams that you carry out in PRINCE2 product-based planning. As identifying which products are needed and the sequence or flow in which they're created could allow you to uncover potential risks. Using SWOT analysis, which stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Any one of these strengths could help you to maximise an opportunity or reduce the impact of a threat. And the weaknesses, the reverse, of course. So the idea is to brainstorm these and then in that way help you to manage risks. Flowchart diagrams showing sequences. In this case, showing the logical steps to accomplish some objective. For example, if this was a piece of software that you were writing, then the steps and sequences may throw up areas where risk needs to be managed within the development. The next step is assess, and this has two sub-steps, if you will, the first being estimate. To assess the threats and opportunities in terms of their probability, impact and proximity. Now, the threat or an opportunity impact changes over the life of the project, quite naturally, either due to internal situations or external. One of the ways in which you can plot how serious each risk is, is called a summary risk profile. This as a simple matrix of probability from very high to very low against impact very low to very high. And each one of these red buttons here represents the number of a particular risk. The value of this is you could set where risk tolerance is 
and any risks which occur outside of that are things which need to be escalated immediately or dealt with, the idea being to get these back closer to the origin here. This can be a quite a useful diagram to accompany, for example, highlight reports to the project board, since it can show trends. Here it was last month, and this month it's here. So the project manager would need to explain why it's gone from medium to high in terms of probability. This leads us to the probability impact grid, which at first seems somewhat similar, but in fact it has a much more powerful use. Notice it has probability against impact still. And the ranges go from 0.9 to 0.1 in terms of probability, very high, high and so on, with percentages given. In a somewhat similar way, the impact goes from very low to very high. This time the scale goes from 0.05 to 0.8. Now you may be wondering why these two scales are different. Well the answer is, if you had a risk with 0.5 probability and 0.5 impact, in terms of probability this would be seen as a medium risk, but in terms of impact, this would be seen as somewhere between high and very high, and therefore giving a bias towards high impact risks. Let's add the rest of this screen. What we have here is a multiplication of each segment. In this case, 0.9 times 0.05 gives you 0.045. Here's the rest. If you continue multiplying these, you'll get these figures. Again, just multiplying each one, and I've coloured these pink for a good reason. And finally, again, just multiplying these together, you will have these probability impact numbers. What's the difference? Well, all of these risks with fairly low probability impacts, you might choose just to accept the risk. Do nothing about it because it's tolerable. Those in pink, you might decide you need to be proactive about and you need to create appropriate responses for them, whereas those in the red section need to be escalated to the project board since they exceed tolerance. So again, this is a very useful tool to help you determine how best to manage risks. Still in the assess step, but this time going to the evaluate, assessing the net effect of the aggregated threats. What this is doing is assessing the overall risk severity. And the question to be answered is, is this level of overall risk severity within the project board tolerance, and does the project still have business justification? In other words, is the business case still viable? And we use something here called expected monetary value, EMV. And this also, by the way, can be used to calculate the risk budget, which I mentioned earlier. For each risk, and I've just shown four here as an example, you'd have a unique risk identification number, its probability in percentage, and its impact if it occurred in monetary terms. And what you simply do is multiply 75%, 0.75 by 3, to get £22,500. And we do that for each of the four risks. Then we add up the expected value to give the expected monetary value. The idea behind this thinking is that it would be very unfortunate if all the risks all happened. So it's best to try and come up with a factored cost and in this way, the 33,000 in this example could be used as a risk budget, reasonably set against the aggregation of all the risks, their probabilities and financial impacts. We're now going on to the plan step, which is to prepare the responses for both threats and opportunities, to remove or reduce threats, and of course to maximise opportunities. What's important is we need to balance the cost and time of each response against the probability and impact of the risk occurring. And guess what? All of these responses will end up in a Prince plan, either the project plan or the stage plans or the team plans. So let's look at these responses in turn, starting with responses for threats. Avoid is to take some form of action up front to either stop the risk from occurring and or reduce its impact to zero. Reduce is where you take some actions up front to reduce the probability or the impact or both. Fallback, used to be called contingency, is putting a plan in place only to be used should the linked risk actually occur. Transfer is where you transfer the responsibility to the risk to a third party. So it is they that have the pain, so the costs for the risk and the impact of the risk will be borne by them, not by the project. And accept, this is the do nothing option. It may well be that you can accept the risk even though it may hurt a little. The other point here is that sometimes 
taking action against a risk is out of proportion to the impact the risk will have in the first place. When it comes to opportunities, exploit, this is taking some action with the objective of increasing the probability of this particular opportunity happening. Enhance, this is a response that would make the opportunity even better if it happens. And reject, somewhat similar to the do nothing of accept for a threat, rejecting is your decision not to take any actions for a particular opportunity. There is one response which you can use for both threats and opportunities, and it's called share. This is where you would have some pain gain formula, where in the case of a threat, the pain, for example, financial pain, would be shared between both parties. And in the case of an opportunity, where, for example, some form of payment or costed benefits would be shared between both parties. The next step is implement, and this is where you need to have clear risk roles and responsibilities. In effect, you're building your risk responses into the various plans and as a project manager, making sure they're happening and that risks are being appropriately managed. In this case, there is a role called a risk owner. It may be the project manager. It could even be members of the project board and they are responsible for managing the responses and monitoring the effectiveness of such responses and controlling by taking action to ensure the responses are having the appropriate effect. The risk owner may delegate the actions to a role called the risk action E, in which case the owner is managing it and the action E is carrying out the appropriate response actions and reporting back to the risk owner. The final step, which is this one, the communicate step, of course runs in parallel and will be carried out continually to ensure that threat and opportunity information is communicated both within the project and external to it. Here the main document created in the initiation stage is the communication management strategy and it will dictate how communications are to take place, including of course risks. Checkpoint reports will contain risk status as will highlight reports at the end of a stage and end stage report will describe the risk situation as will the end project report and any follow on actions if you remember from my second slide. The lessons report will contain any risk management learnings to be passed on for future projects. Well, that just about wraps up. So my name's been Dave Litton. Thank you for watching, and I encourage you to check out the only APM Group licensed foundation and practitioner downloadable Prince2 video training on www.prince2primer.com.